Welcome everybody and thank you for joining me today in this uh, and then talking about biocompatibility specifically with the big three tests. And so for those of you that don't um, kind of understand what the big three are, I have these uh, slide rules up here in case you want to, uh, you can actually take them afterwards, but it's the ISO 10993 chart in a slide form. So you can determine what testing is needed for your device per the ISO 10993. But as you see, as you slide through this, the, these three first tests, the cytotoxicity, sensitization, and irritation, are marked on every single thing. And that's why we call them the big threes, because of the three tests that everybody either has to perform or justify why they did not perform. So if you, if you want one of these afterwards, come up and take it. I, I promise I won't charge you anything unless you want to drop off some donations. That's fine. Um, so we're going to be talking about rethinking the big three today specifically. So I'm going to be doing three sessions. Uh, there's going to be breaks in between if you do want to hear all three, just so you know what they are. The first one's the rethinking the big three. The second one's about using chemical characterization on changing an already approved device and how you can use that chemistry to get out of potentially doing biocompatibility. And then the third talk that I'll be doing this morning, it has to do with the new guidance document that came out in April of last year and some updates on that guidance document. So this first one, like I said before, we're talking about the big three, but specifically we're talking about how we're going to change the big three in the future. Um, this is something that's very exciting to the, to the geeks like me because we're actually taking away the animals out of the equation for the, the three tests. And we're trying to make them all in vitro or cell tests, uh, which will save on cost and turnaround time for you, but also save on the, on the use of animals. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to talk about, um, we're going to go very high level over what the big three tests look for. What is cytotoxicity? What is sensitization? What is irritation? And then we're going to talk about those in vitro alternatives that hopefully uh, will be coming to light very soon. The first thing that we have to understand when we're looking at the big three is there a difference between the direct contact version of these tests and the indirect version. So for the direct contact test, we put the test sample directly in contact with the test system. Okay? So if you have, um, I don't know, a Band-Aid or something like that, we can actually take the device and put it directly in contact with either the cells or put it directly in contact with the animal. So as you can see up here on this uh, right side or your left side, those samples are placed directly onto the cells. So that's the direct contact test. The next version is the extraction test. This is where we take your device and we put it into a liquid media. Okay, we kind of make like a soup out of it, a chemical soup. So we try to pull the chemicals off the device that would normally go in the body and we pull those into that liquid. And then we use that liquid to test. So the, the liquid becomes the test sample, not the sample itself. So one is the sample is directly in contact with the test and the other one is where we extract or use a liquid sample. Now, the big three tests have each of these versions. So you get to decide which one to do, either the direct contact or the extraction. The choice kind of comes to how the sample is intended to be used. If the sample is in direct contact with the skin, intact skin contact, then we use the direct contact method because that is clinically mimics that type of contact. If your device has any other type of contact, like uh, mucosal membrane, blood, tissue, we do the extraction versions, because this mimics that kind of contact. If there's a gray area, if you're not quite sure which one your, your device falls into, the extraction um, versions are always considered worst case. So if you use the extraction version, then we can, we can justify using that one over the direct contact. Even if your device has intact skin contact, it might make sense to use the direct method, clinically speaking, but we also have to think about how the test is ran, okay? Some devices are quite large that go on the skin, like scanners, um, oh, like big old uh, skin contacting devices that we can't really put on the back of a guinea pig or a rabbit. So those we might have to extract, even if it is intact skin. So really the direct contacting versions works great for things like masks and gowns and those kind of devices that are thin, flexible, that we can put on the back of an animal. Everything else we really try to extract. So these are the big three versions of the extraction methods. For the cytotoxicity, we have the MEM elution, 
For the sensitization, we have the magnesium Kligman or the local lymph node assay. And for the irritation, we have the intracutaneous reactivity. Okay, so those are the three versions. And because most devices contact some kind of fluid in the body, these are the most common versions of the big three tests. These are the direct contact versions of the big three. So for the cytotoxicity, we have auger overlay. For the sensitization, we have the Bueller method. And for the irritation, we have primary skin. Okay, these are the ones that are in contact with the animals or the cells themselves. The first thing that we have to talk about, and this goes with just not the big three, but any biocompatibility test, is sample preparation. This sample preparation is where everything can be variable. In fact, if you tell me, call me up and said, we did a test at your competitor's lab, and we did a test with you guys, and we failed at one and passed at the other, can you help me figure out why? The first thing I'm gonna do is look at how it was prepared. Because once we get the liquid extract, from that point on, it's pretty common. It's a common test that every lab runs, pretty much the same. So the variation comes in how it's prepared. The first thing that you have to look at is the uh, standard gives us two options for sample preparation. We have surface area and weight, okay? So we can either do a surface area of the contacting, the portions that contact the patient, or we can weigh the device. And that helps us determine the amount of volume we need to add. So to give you an example, Let's take my business cards, which don't make a great medical device, but we can use our imagination, right? So if this is the surface area of the device, and let's say the surface is this that contacts the patient, then I can either do the surface area of my business cards, or I can weigh this. And the bigger the surface area, the more fluid I'd add to it to extract. The heavier it is, the more fluid I would add to extract. Does that make sense? So that helps us determine by the sample, either the size or the mass, how much volume of extract we would add to it. Now, there is a big difference between surface area and weight. And to give you a kind of an idea, I use this example, which is a, a partial knee. It's a very common medical device. It's made out of titanium and some kind of hard plastic, I can't remember. But it's a very common type of device, right? So the weight of this de device is 93.9 grams. So it's, it's a relatively heavy device, but not extremely heavy. I mean, we've had knees and hip implants that weigh a lot more than this, okay? So the weight ratio in the standard is 0.2 grams per mil. So for every 0.2 grams, we would add one mil of that liquid extract to make our soup or extraction. So if we did this weight ratio for this uh, implant, we would add almost 500 mils of fluid to that extraction, okay? So the same device would get about half a liter almost of extraction fluid. The surface area of this device is 115.8 centimeters squared. Using the ratio in the standard, it's every three centimeters squared, we'd add a mil. So if we do that ratio, we would add almost 40 mils, okay? So same device, both following ISO 10993 extraction ratios, but one by weight would give us 12 times more fluid than surface area. What this means, for us is that the, if you did your device by weight, you would have it diluted out 12 times more. And if there is something toxic on your device, you probably wouldn't see it with 12 times more fluid in that extract uh, compared to the surface area. And for this reason, the FDA prefers surface area over weight. In fact, if you choose weight, the, you're gonna have to justify to the FDA why you chose weight and justifica the justification that it takes less samples is not gonna work, right? You have to have a scientific ra a rationale. Some of the scientific rationales we use, there are some devices that you can't come up the surface area with, like powders, um, absorbent samples, like sponges, because it, the fluid goes into all the internal components and you really can't come up with an accurate surface area. Um, so powders and absorbent samples are really the only samples that we can use weight for. The only other option is if you have a device that's very light, but has a lot of surface area, then weight could be considered worst case. And in that case, we could use weight. But really, those are the only three options we have with weight. Everything else should be done by surface area. Okay, so with that, really quickly, I kind of want to touch um, with the impact of a change in surface area before we get into the big three. And this is something that I don't think a lot of people look at. So let's say you have a catheter and the distal end of the catheter is very small. So you do all your testing and it passes and it's on the market. But now you want to change your distal end and you want to make it a little longer. 
maybe twice as long as it is in the generation one. Using the same materials, the same processing, a lot of people don't even consider biocompatibility because you're not changing materials or processing. But when you look at the surface area now of the device compared to the original device, that distal tip is now more of the surface area than previously. So if there's something toxic on the distal tip, it's now weighted more in the extract compared to the first version. It doesn't mean that you have to repeat all your biocompatibility, but changing surface areas, you still have to make considerations about biocompatibility and how the impact of a change may affect the biocompatibility. Okay, so once we know how much fluid to extract the device in, the next thing we have to talk about is how hot and how long we extract it, right? All of these right here are out of the ISO 10993. That first one, the 37 degrees, this is all Celsius, by the way, because I'm in science, so I don't deal with Fahrenheit, right? So 37 degrees Celsius for 24 hours, that's only for cytotoxicity. And we'll kind of talk about that in a minute. The other four are for the animal tests. So we can extract at 37 degrees for 72 hours, 50 degrees for 72 hours, 70 degrees for 24, or 121 degrees for one hour. So those are our options. Which one to choose, right? So we know how much fluid, but how hot and how long do we extract it? A lot of people want to choose 37 degrees because 37 degrees is body temperature. And so since the device is going to the body, they say, I'm gonna choose 37 degrees. But that 72 hours is what's tricky. If your device has longer than 72 hour contact with the body, we recommend ex exaggerating your extraction to 50 degrees to get more of a long-term exhaustive extraction so we can really see what comes off the device. In fact, the FDA is gonna ask you if you choose at 37 degrees to justify why. So if you don't wanna to talk to the FDA and if your sample can handle 50 degrees, just extract it at 50 degrees. There's no reason not to. The only reason not to extract at 50 degrees is if your glass transition phase is 60 degrees Celsius or below. So if your device is gonna manipulate or change at 60 degrees or 50 degrees, then we don't wanna extract that, we wanna go at the safe temperature, okay? So now we have how much volume to add to the device, we know how long we're gonna extract it and what temperature. The next thing we gotta do is actually test the extract, right? We gotta use that fluid to put on the cells or the animal. So these are the three tests for cytotoxicity. The MEM elution is the one that we're gonna be kind of talking about today. Uh, it's the historic test that we run for cytotoxicity. It's been run for years. And it's also the one that's the, the easiest and quickest in, the one to run. These are my tools of the trade, so to speak, okay? So <clears throat> the cytotoxicity deals with cells. They use L929 cells, which are mouse fibroblast cells. And why that's important is because the L929 cells are the most common cells used for the cytotox test. You might want to use a cell that's clinically relevant, like if you're in the ocular contact, you might want to use an ocular cell line. Um, you might want to use a neural cell line if you're in the brain. But really, we want to use the L929 because it's the cell line that we have the most history with. We know how the responses are to it. And it's the um, one that everyone works with, so you can compare scores to uh, sample to sample. So we grow the cells in those flasks. Those are my cell farms, so to speak. And they adhere or stick to the back of that flask. So we let the cells grow in that flask and then we break those cells apart and we seed them in these six well plates. So we put the cells on the bottom of these plates and now they grow on the bottom of the plates. Now I can take my extract of the device and put it onto those cells. And we let those chemicals kind of interact with the cells for about 48 hours and then we look at how the cells responded. What kind of impact did the chemicals off your device have on those cells? That purple pink fluid, that's called minimal essential media. And that's where the MEM elution gets its name. MEM, minimal essential media. But all you need to know is that that MEM fluid is a cell culture media. So it gives the cells what it needs to grow. For the cytotoxicity test, this is the extract fluid we use, the MEM fluid. It has a phenol red indicator in it, which means that it will turn yellow if it's acidic or turn purple if it's basic. And that's important because, well, cells don't like a lot of acidity and they don't like a lot of, um, you know, base, right? They, they, they like about 7.3 pH is what they like. So we want to use, make sure that the, the cells maintain that pH by looking at the color change. So 
Per ISO 10993-12, we have to extract in both a polar and non-polar extraction. And to kind of help with, for those of you that don't really understand polar and non-polar, it's like salad dressing, vinegar and oil, right? They separate, they don't mix. Oils are non-polar, vinegar is polar. There are things on our bodies that are polar and non-polar. Oils, fats are all non-polar. A lot of blood and everything else is polar. And there are certain chemicals, they're called lipophobic and lipophilic, that will come off in oils that won't come off in water. And other ones that will come off in water are not in oils. Since our body has both, we have to extract both in a polar and non-polar. The only, one of the only exceptions to this is that cytotoxicity test. And as you can see in the bottom, we have culture media as both polar and non-polar. The reason why is because all the other non-polar options are cytotoxic. So PEG, DMSO, vegetable oil will all kill cells. So we have to extract in culture media. We add 5% calf serum to that media, which is non-polar, so it has some non-polarity to it, but in reality, most of the extract is polar. But that's why we can only extract at 37 degrees for 24 hours for the cytotox, because that calf serum will denature if we extract at a higher temperature or for longer durations. So if you remember that time and temperature chart, that 37 degrees for 24 hours was only for the cytotox, and that's because we extract in that purple fluid. All the other tests, we use cottonseed oil and saline or DMSO that can take 50 degrees or higher. So that's why we can extract at higher temperatures. The cytotoxicity test is the quickest, the most inexpensive, and the most sensitive test that we have for biocompatibility. What that means is that if you're gonna fail a biocomp test, the cytotoxicity is the test you're gonna fail. In fact, at Nelson Labs, over the last 13 years, we looked at our failures and nine times out of 10, 93% of the time, to be, correct, to be uh, precise, if you're gonna fail biocompatibility, it's gonna be cytotoxicity, okay? That doesn't mean you're gonna fail 93% of the time or else we'd all have headaches, right? But if you're going to fail 93% of the time, it's gonna be cytotox. But that's okay because it's also the cheapest and quickest, which means it's a great screening test, right? If you're comparing materials, deciding what material to use, or you just wanna go into the animal test with some assurances, the cytotoxicity is a great test to kind of run first to get that kind of assurance. There are some problems that we see with the cytotox, some, some historic ones that we know about, and it's over there in the usual problems. Latex is our positive control, so if you have latex in your device, it's gonna fail. Okay, natural rubbers, same thing. Silver, copper, zinc, those kind of metals will all fail cytotoxicity. Short curing times on, on inks, and adhesives, it just happens to be that a lot of inks have silver and copper in them, right, to make them that color. So if you're not curing, then you're gonna fail. In fact, we do something, and it's kind of a joke at Nelson Labs, we call it the smell test. If you guys ever open a device from a bag and you smell like a volatile kind of chemical smell, yet all those chemicals are going into my extract, right? So if you can smell it, it's chances are that it's not gonna be very good in my test. So those probably didn't cure long enough. Something in that device has not been cured, and uh, there's a good chance that it won't pass the cytotox test, okay? Now the cytotox, that TAT is turnaround time, so four to five days for a cytotox report. Very quick, very inexpensive, uh, and, and very sensitive, okay? So once we have the uh, MEM fluid on the cells, we then have to score them. And we use the scoring criteria of zero to four where zero is, in fact, this is the actual scale right here. This is out of the ISO 1093-5 and the USP section 87. And it's based off percentages. So a zero means no cytotoxicity whatsoever. A one is less than 20%. So you have some there, but it's less than 20. A two is between 20 and 50. A three is between 50 and 70. Anything over 70% is a four. So this is how we score the cells. And this is the only ISO test that has an acceptance criteria built in. Zero, one, and two is passing. Three and four is failing, okay? So you can have up to 50% of your cells affected in some way and still pass the test. That just kind of shows you how sensitive the test is, okay? So to give you an idea what we look for, this is a zero. This is what we want to see. We want to see these great mosaic patterns on the cells. We want to see them kind of stretching out, making connections. That means they're healthy and growing. You can also see the red color in the cell. That's because we stain them with something called neutral red. 
Newts are red as a viable stain, which means healthy, happy cells will bring it into the lysosomes and stain red. So we want to see that stain, okay? So this is a zero. Everything looks really good. Everything's happy and healthy. That's compared to this, which is a four. This is latex. So it's a fixative, so it kind of burns the cells to the bottom of the plate. It kind of looks like skeletons down there, okay? You can also see that there's no red. That's because these cells are not uptaking any of that stain. In fact, at the very bottom down there that has a little tag that says alive but not healthy, that one might still be hanging on for dear life, but it's not doing very good, okay? So this is how we score the cells. We look at the cells and we make a scoring determination per percentage and give you a score, zero, one, two, three, or four. And that's really the cytotox test. Any questions about cytotoxicity before we move on? Okay, so for these next two tests, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you a very high level of how we look at irritation and sensitization today, what they mean, okay? But then I'm gonna talk about what we're doing right now to make them in vitro tests and kind of explain what the in vitro alternative is. So the irritation, the best way that I can explain irritation, and it's a quick personal experience, uh, my wife, she went away on the, like a girl's night out, right? And she left me at home alone with the kids, which was a dangerous thing, but she did it anyway. And so I thought I'd get some, uh, some brownie points, and so I thought I'd do laundry, right? But we were out of laundry detergent, so I went to the store to buy laundry detergent, and the one that my wife usually buys is really expensive, and the one I want to buy, because I'm a cheap guy, is cheap, right? So I buy the cheapest one I can find, I come home and I do some laundry and I do pajamas for my kids and I'm thinking this is great, I get my kids in the bath, I got the jammies washed, got them changed, put them in bed, I'm feeling pretty good about myself. Until they woke up the next morning and they had rashes all over their bodies, right? That rashes were from the detergent because they had an irritation response and my wife had an irritation response too when she came home and, and saw the rashes. But um, what that means is an irritation is an immediate reaction to an antigen that we never have to see before. It's an immediate response to something that our body only has to see once and we have a breakout, okay? For that reason, what we use right now, we use a rabbit irritation test to look for that. So we take extracts of your device, we use vegetable oil and we use uh, saline and we extract your device and we inject it intercutaneously into rabbits. We do five sites on one side of the spine and five control sites on the other side of the spine. The controls are just cotton seed and oil by themselves. So you get the negative control as the control and then the test samples. And all we're looking for is redness and swelling. Stuff that you guys are familiar with when you look at irritation, right? We do this in three rabbits, okay? So you have three rabbits, you have five sites per rabbit and each site gets scored at 24, 48 and 72 hours. Okay, so you basically have 15, uh, three rabbits, five sites, three times. So that's how we do the math to get the, um, the score. So we do a score per rabbit, kind of an average, and then we take the average of the three to get you an uh, overall test average. If your irritation score is one or higher on your test sites compared to the control sites, then you're an irritant, okay? One exposure in this test. That's all we need because an irritation is immediate response. And we do it in rabbits and it's localized so we can do multiple injections per the same animal. It's not systemic, so we can do a localized injection. Okay? This test is not as long. It takes about four to five weeks. Okay? And it costs about twelve to thirteen hundred dollars depending on where you go. So it's kind of long, kind of expensive, and we use these three animals. We are now looking at validating an in vitro alternative to this test. And this is very exciting in the industry, something that we're very excited about. And we're going to kind of talk about how we use these epi fake epidermis. Actually, they're not fake. They're derived from human skin. But they are um, uh, epidermis tissue that's constructed to mimic human uh, skin. And in the bottom there, you can actually see them. They're very, very small. And uh, they come... In fact, I believe, as you can see in the chart, the one on the bottom is actually a, a derived human epidermis, and the one on the top is an is a, a actual human epidermis. So we, have a re we call them reconstructed human epidermis, or RHE. Okay? So we get these human epidermises, and they are just like little samples of skin. And they have the same physiological properties of, of your, and barrier properties of your skin. So they mimic the human reaction uh, very well. 
Our current method right now has been validated by ECVAM in Europe. It stands for a European Central Alternative to, vet, to Animal Testing. They did this huge 2 million euro validation to show that we can use this current method for, and they, they validated for chemicals and cosmetics. So what we're looking at doing at the ISO 10993 is we're looking at piggybacking that validation onto medical devices. So all we have to do is manipulate it a little bit to get a medical device into that test system and be able to show that it has the same properties, the same potential that it do does with chemicals and cosmetics. So the slight difference, well first let me tell you how that works. The first thing that we do is we expose the test article to our RHEs, our epidermis. And then what we do is we do an MTT test on the bottom of that epidermis. An MTT test is a cytotoxicity test. But unlike the MEM elution, which I showed, instead of putting that bread stain on there, we use this salt. Um, this salt is a, is a blue salt that a healthy cell will absorb into its cell membrane. We then use an alcohol to bring out all the blue from the cells, and we measure how much blue is there. The more blue, the more healthy and happy cells there are, because sick, unhappy cells will keep it away. Does that make sense? So we want to see more blue. Blue means good, okay? It also will help us show, because those cells at the bottom of the tissue, if they've been damaged, that's the first step to the irritation. So the MTT will help us uh, determine the potential irritation from the extract. We can also get a quantitative measure because we can measure exactly how much blue or purple is in the stain. Okay? So, I talked about already about chemicals and, and cosmetics. They already use this in Europe to validate or to test for irritation for cosmetics and, your, and um, chemicals. Also in Europe, they're accepting this, this version of the irritation test for medical devices. So if you're going to Europe, you can do the in vitro irritation for your test, your device. The FDA at this point is not accepting this in vitro alternative. They're waiting for more robust data, a comparison between the animal tests and the in vitro tests to be able to justify accepting this test. But we believe that through the, the round robin that we're going to be doing at the ISO 10993 level, we have 13 labs across the world that are doing a bunch of different materials, running it on the in vitro irritation, again, showing comparison against the animal test to be able to show the FDA and all other regulatory agencies that in vitro irritation is actually probably more sensitive than the animal test. And it can be used as a screening, and if you do show some irritation on this test, then you can move to the animal test to confirm that irritation. What that means for you guys, though, I talked about the animal test is about four weeks long. Um, it costs about $1,300. Once we get the tissues into a more rotation, this test only takes a couple weeks to run. So we can cut half the time off your turnaround time. And once we get into a more efficient process, it will also be cheaper. So right now, Nelson Labs has this test validated. So we can run it for you. But once again, you can only submit that data to Europe for a submission. FDA at this point won't accept it. If you want to run both and submit it to the FDA for, to help the cause, I'll give you a thumbs up and a clap. But right now, Europe's the only one that will accept it by itself. So to give you kind of a quick run how we do it, we extract your devices in a polar and non-polar. We use vegetable oil and saline, just like the animal tests. We get the um, tissues shipped to us, and we uh, remove them and inspect them to make sure that they're not dry or cracked or damaged in any way. And then we put them on some fresh media, okay? We let them kind of grow and get uh, transfer into uh, overnight and to be prepared into our system. And then we take a small amount, 100 microliters of your extract, and we do a triplicate on top of the, the skin. So we topically apply your extract to these uh, RHEs. And then we run the MTT on the test itself. So after we rinse it and expose it, we then carefully dry it do the MTT on the bottom of the, of the tests of the tissues. And then this is an example of MTT test. So we want to see the purple, right? The purple means healthy cells. The clear means uh, cells that have been affected by an irritant. And so we can run this MTT and determine cell viability, which shows potential of irritation. This gives you analysis. So you look at our positive control down there. It has very little cell viability. That's, a, that's what we want from a positive control, right? We want to show irritation. 
And then our negative controls and the sample test our, our article extract also had some uh, percent viability. For this test, we want to have the viability of over 50%. So you see the red line? That's a pass-fail. So we want to have 50% viability or more in our test system to be able to show no irritation. So this is the in vitro irritation test that we're looking at justifying. And like I said, right now we're getting a lot of momentum going. We do these, these tests all the time for European submission and we're starting to get some good very um, comparison with the round robin in the ISO level to be able to present this to the FDA. And we hope in the next couple of years we'll be able to have this in vitro test as an alternative to the animal test to be able to save you time, money, and also the animals um, themselves. Okay. Very quickly, we're going to go over sensitization because it too has an in vitro alternative that we're exploring. So right now, the tests that most people use to do irritation is the guinea pig maximization. It's been around for decades. Very common test ran. It's ran on guinea pigs. We'll kind of talk a little bit about how we run it right now. So we extract in a polar and non-polar, just like we talked about, like every other biocompatibility test, right? But we have three phases. And this is because the sensitization is something called a delayed hypersensitivity or type 4 hypersensitivity. What that means, and the good example is poison ivy. Everyone knows poison ivy, or if you don't, you can go get introduced to it, I'm sorry. But um, what poison ivy is, though, it's a sensitizer. But the first time you contact the poison ivy, you actually don't break out. You don't realize you've, you've touched that poison ivy, but your body does. Because it has these little cells that remembers that antigen. So the next time you touch it, or the third time you touch the plant, that's when you break out. So because of that reason, it's systemic, like you can touch poison ivy the first time on your finger, and the next time on your foot, and you break out. And because you have to have multiple exposures, we have this test is very long and very expensive. So we have an induction one phase, and that's where we extract in a polar and non-polar, and we inject a small amount of the extract into the guinea pig. We can't do multiple per animal because it's systemic, and we have to do multiple exposures because of the sensitization. So we do one, we let them rest, let the, the body bi biochemistry work. Then we do a second induction phase where we extract, we, in, we inject into the guinea pig, let the guinea pig's biochemistry work. And then we do a challenge phase where we wet a patch, and then we put that patch over the injection site. But we're still looking for the redness and swelling, right, that everyone has seen. But because it takes so long to see that buildup, this test takes eight to nine weeks to run. And because it, it takes so many guinea pigs and so long, it costs up into the seven, eight, or $9,000 range, depending. So it's the most expensive of the big three by far, and it's the longest of the big three by far. And for that reason, the in vitro alternative for this one is very desirable and something that we're working very hard on. So that's poison ivy reaction. Um, everyone's familiar with, I hope, or hope not, I guess. So we expose the guinea pigs, and then we look for the same reaction as we did from the irritation, which is redness and swelling. We scored on a scale from zero to four, or zero to three, depending on the lab you use. A uh, zero is no redness and swelling whatsoever. A one could be slight redness or slight swelling um, at the site. A two is either uh, slight swelling and slight redness. And then a three could be a severe redness and severe swelling. Really, the ISO gives you just an opportunity to score um, on a scale. So you have to be able to determine what is your scale. This is just an example of a scale. But then you take the average score of the test guinea pigs compared to the average score of the controls. And if you're one or greater, then you're considered a sensitizer. So same acceptance criteria of the irritation too. Really, the only difference is that you can only use it one animal at a time. And you, um, you have to have multiple injections to look for sensitization. Okay, so now we're going to look at the in vitro alternative to sensitization. We uh, have three different options for this test. And right now, ECVAM is actually doing a validation for the three tests themselves. So hopefully we're going to be able to have ECVAM do that validation first and give us clues on how to do it for the medical device. We're still waiting for them to finish their validation. The first um, in vitro assay that we use to predict uh, sensitization through an in vitro method is glutathione reduction, okay? So glutathione, it says right up there, but it's a, it's a tripeptide 
antioxidant found in living cells, and it's a marker to, to ability to uh, substance to bind proteins within the skin. Okay, so really, glutathione binds these proteins of the sensitizer, and so we, what we're looking for is the amount of these glutathione's in the solution. So we we met we incubate a medical device extract. So we extract a medical device in polar and nonpolar, and we incubate that extract with a solution of glutathione. Okay. Remember that glutathione binds these proteins. So then, if there's a sensitizer present, the glutathione has bound to that sensitizer. Then, after we let that solution mix with the, or incubate, then we add um, a mixture called Elements Reagent, and that's a colorless compound, but if it reacts with free glutathione, it turns yellow. So let's see if we can keep it with. We have a solution that if it has sensitizers there, it will bind with this glutathione. And then we add the element, right? If the element only binds with free glutathione, so if it's bound with sensitizers, it won't bind, and so the solution will be clear. It won't turn yellow. But if there's free glutathione, the solution will turn yellow because the element's agent's bound with that free uh, glutathione. So that means the more yellow, the less sensitization. So we want to see yellow in this, this test. So we extract, we, we uh, mix it with the glutathione, then we add the elements reagent, and we hope that we see yellow, because that means there's, there's not been a bound up sensitization reaction. So this gives you a chemical um, reaction of, for, for it, the glutathione combined with uh, a sensitizer, and if it's bound with a sensitizer, it won't bind with that yellow, but if it's free, it will bind with the yellow and turn yellow, so we want to see it yellow. So that's the first version of the in vitro sensitization. The second version of the in vitro sensitization is we use an ARE gene. Okay, that's not R. I guess you could call it R gene if you want, but it's an ARE gene. And it, these genes are expressed with a sensitizer. So once again, we expose a medical device extracts to, um, to the RNA from the tissues. So we use the same tissues that we use in the irritation. So we put the extract onto the tissues then we take our PCR, so we break up all those tissues and we use a PCR to measure the expression of those ARE genes. So we want to see if those genes have been expressed by a sensitizer. So this is a way that we can compare that to a negative control to see if there's sensitization present on those skins. Same skins we use for the irritation, but instead of doing an MTT test on the bottom, we break them apart and put them on our PCR to look for an expression of those genes. So this gives you kind of an a example. That's a PCR up there, um, in case you ever wanted to see a white box. That's pretty much what a PCR is. But it shows you what we're looking for as far as an expression of those genes compared to a negative control. OK, the last in vitro alternative is really just another MTT test. We, we want to run it uh, on the same tissues. And we run it, but instead of looking doing an MTT, we do a cytotoxicity test called an LDH but it still looks for cytotoxicity. So really what we're looking for is cell viability again, because if there is a sensitization, then there's a reaction that happens to the cells and there's toxicity that happens to the cells. The question I always get when I talk about this, well, if you're running an MTT or cytotoxicity test on irritation and you're running one on the sensitization, how do you know what's an irritation response and what's a sensitization response? And the reason why that, well, the, what we have to do is we can't just do a cytotox test by itself. We have to do a kind of a combination of tests for the sensitization. For the irritation, we can do just one, that one test. And then we can look for interleukins, which is a, a, a presence from an irritant. But for the sensitization, it's going to look something like this, where we take the device, we extract it, we expose it, oh, sorry, this is the, yeah, sorry, we expose it to the tissues. But from that extract, we can do the glutathione test. Then we take it on the tissue, and from the tissues, we can do the RNA isolation with the PCR. And then we can also do the LDH cytotoxicity test. So we do all three tests in one setting to help predict sensitization. That's what Nelson Labs does for our in vitro sensitization. we have talking with the ECVAM. This is their approach also to help validate it. So for the irritations, it's going to be one test. For the sensitization, it's going to be kind of a combination of tests together, uh, we believe, to be the actual in vitro sensitization. The benefit, though, once again, the, the animal sensitization test is eight to nine weeks long, very expensive, 
Once again, we can do this test in two to three weeks and be a fraction of the cost. So the hope is not, I mean, obviously we want to save animals and that's the big push, but for medical device manufacturers, we're going to be able to save costs and turnaround time for these tests. So I put some references down there. Are there any questions? We do have these tests validated at Nelson Labs. Like I said, if you're submitting to Europe and you want to save time and money, they're valuable options to run. Like I said, with the FDA, you want to be careful because the FDA won't accept them at this current time. But we are working with Jennifer Good, Molly Gosh, a bunch of FDA uh, representatives to get the protocol through them so that eventually when we get the results, we'll be able to show them that these tests are predictive uh, and more sensitive. And so we can run them instead of the animal tests. Um, I have some uh, things back there. If you want some of the testing matrix, come up here and grab them. I have my cards up here too if you, if you want to contact information. If you have any other questions, just let me know. Thank you very much.